Um, okay, so I went to Manchester High School for Girls, so just down the road from MMU. I It took me three years to do A-levels, so I left school at 19 with two C's and a D. Um, I went to MMU to do Biomed through Clearing, um, so obviously not the grades to go into medicine. Um, I decided in the middle of second year that I definitely wanted to do something more after my degree. I didn't know whether that was going to be a master's or graduate entry medicine. I didn't know what was achievable. Um, so then at the beginning of third year, I really threw myself into it. I I prepared for all of the entry exams. Um, I submitted my application. And yeah, it all went from there. And now I'm doing graduate entry medicine at Barts in the London. Perfect. So when you said you you prepare for all three of the entry exams did you did you set all three of them in that one year yes so i i did end up doing all of them purely because i wanted more options of where i could apply but actually um my best scores came from ucat <laughs> so I, I guess you're very unique in that you you have a perspective on all of the uh, admissions exams so I guess the question would be how did you find each one and is there any like tips or any like advantages for each one that you found while sitting them? Um, I would say the one that took the longest to prepare for was definitely GAMSAT. Um, I almost had to reteach myself A level sciences so across the board chemistry, biology and physics. Um, I think maybe that was something I personally had to do because I didn't do so great in those exams. So I didn't come from a very strong foundation. Um, which other ones? The UCAT, I found that I did, what's that website called? So you got, is it Medify? And... Yeah, the one that has the whole, all of the questions on. Yeah, so where, where you can like sit the exams like, like almost like a practice like it has the the same style calculator you can sit like timed exams yeah yeah medify yeah i i found that to be such a great help um i did that for maybe three months before i sat the exam and what's the last what's the last one called the beat the beat Bima, yeah okay so the beam was quite similar in preparation to the gamsat but um less intense yeah I, so i guess talking about the gamsa and the beam mat the one of the major questions with both of them is how do you exactly prepare for it especially with the gamsa because there's no specific guidelines on you need to know this this and this to answer these questions it's almost you need to say like i guess you can say it like applied knowledge of uh, biology chemistry and physics and then but there's no real guidance on what you need to actually study. So what did you find useful while studying for the GAMSAT and the BMAT? And is there any like particular resources you found that were useful? Um, I found that it was like a, a walk in the dark. Um, and like most people, there's just not very much information out there. I probably bought every textbook and every help book. I probably spent a small fortune trying to get where I am today um and I have to be honest not much of it helped <laughs> what I found helpful was I used the CGP guides I went all the way back down to basics I worked up from GCSE all the way through to A level um doing the workbooks just building that foundational knowledge and I found that doing that all over summer prior to taking the test just really helped all it is is just consistent knowledge-based practice if your knowledge is there you will be able to answer the questions but it's just the the breadth of knowledge is quite is quite something yeah and I, I think people get a bit confused and when they say applied science it's all the all the answers are in the question but it, it's knowing the background knowledge to actually apply apply those uh, answers to the question really um I, I guess moving on to obviously talk about your 
your interviews for your um for your application how did you uh, what, sorry what universities did you apply for um okay um so i applied for warwick newcastle king's college london and bart's in the london and how many interviews did you get out of those um, i had three out of four interviews oh. Wow, so you, you must have been doing something right during the uh, admissions. So I guess when you when you applied then, it sounds like you applied more to the strength of your UCAT exam. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's really, really important. Um, I think some candidates will stand in really good ground with great BMAT results or great GAMSAT results. Don't feel that you have to take all three of them to then have best pick. Play to your strengths. If you know you're great at UCAT, go for UCAT I didn't know I was going to be great I didn't have that assurance so I thought oh it's best that I I have more choice um but then when I looked across all of my scores UCAT was definitely by far my strongest and the definitely the safest option yeah totally and you mentioned that you applied for Warwick so what particular work experience did you undertake so obviously get that 70 hours across two different work experiences okay so um for warwick i put down that i was a carer for um an autistic child um i'd also undertaken work experience in a gp and um i had a lot of experience looking after children so yeah i had a lot of pediatric experience so i easily filled the hours for that but that is one of the first things that they look at so it's very important that you do have it yeah and i guess it goes back to the it's very cliche and it's very very annoying but there's such a bottleneck on applications to graduate entry and it's almost like a tick box if you don't hit those tick boxes then you just get discarded and it's really opened my eyes to the amount of people um that actually don't tick those boxes yet apply to the universities that require them so <laughs> i don't know it's like a wasted choice doesn't it yeah um so i guess again talking about your interviews were they presumably they were all changed this year due to covid so did you have any like mmis still or <laughs> so actually i um I had all of my interviews pre-COVID, so I had all of my interviews in person. Okay. Yeah, so, so it was literally just before all of COVID and lockdown hit. So were, were they all MMIs, I'm guessing? Um, okay, so Warwick was an MMI. Um, that was my first interview around Christmas time. And then I had King's, which was also an MMI. And then I had BOTS, which is um, completely different. They do a team exercise. So it's like a group interview. And then they do um, a one-to-one -one interview. Wow. So I guess how did you find the style of MMIs? Obviously, Warwick and King's are very, very competitive universities. So how did you approach that, that style of uh, interview? Um, okay. So with Warwick uh it was my first interview I didn't really have any idea what I was going into I'd I'd read people's guides I'd looked on YouTube for videos um I'd spoken to close friends but really you don't know what it's going to be like or how you're going to react until you're actually there um the one thing I found with Warwick was that it was almost a very like n negative based interview so it was all about reflecting on the things that you weren't great at and how you could evaluate those situations so they would ask you for example um talk about a scenario where you did something wrong and it led to a bad outcome <laughs> and <laughs> that's not something you prepare for is it and it, it is quite shocking you're like oh no you know I'm not prepared to, to talk about this I'm prepared to make myself glow <laughs> and seem like the most prepared candidate but it just isn't like that yeah um, I guess on the flip side it does make you reflect and obviously they probably well know that nobody's actually prepared for that question so so I guess the, the one thing that everybody gets stuck on during like MMIs is 
the the role playing aspect. So, did you have any particular role playing um, interview stations, and it's all like how did you approach them? Yeah, so um, role play is obviously a really big part of MMIs. It's a, it's a huge part of being a medical student. You know, we do OSCEs and stuff. Um, what I would recommend is to really be yourself and also really understand your limitations. Don't go in there pre- pretending to be a doctor. Um, don't pretend to be something more than what you are. The brief is usually very clear. Um, follow it to a T. They won't ask you to be doing something out of your realms. So, um, yeah, and and almost just feel confident in your own ability. Perfect. Yeah. So, I, I guess looking back now, uh, before you did that, before you began your degree as a med student, is there anything you wish, particularly, you would have known? before you obviously you started? Hello? Sorry, you just cut out a little sorry, bit. Sorry, I, I the wife... I yeah. Sorry, could you repeat that question? Yeah, yeah, no worries. So my my question was, so looking back now, is there anything you wish you would have known before you started your degree as a med student? Okay, so before I started this degree now? Yeah. yeah. Um, when people say to you that doing grad med, well, in particular my course so it's really important to look at how each course is run because that's quite different and the advice that people will give will be slightly different um when people say it it does feel like you're giving up your life for a year or um it will be one of the hardest things that you ever do they're they're being serious they're not (laughs) (laughs) when i say that i have no social life now i'm being deadly serious there's just the sheer volume of work is unbelievable. Yeah, and this is this is one of the most important aspects that I wanted to get out of these uh, guest lectures is that some people that I've spoken to have gone and studied the normal undergrad five year, and some people have obviously gone and studied the graduate entry. And it's trying to justify both of them. Obviously, they're both valid valid ports of entry now, which I didn't know at the start. Obviously you have to pay for the undergrad now and graduate entry is less strenuous like monetary wise so the question is did you ever like consider doing a five year or was it your heart always set on doing the four year and getting through as fast as possible so i i was dead set on doing four years um to me financially it made sense and when i worked out i would have been happy to apply through many cycles of it in order to get a place it's um it's quite common that you don't get a place first time round, so um, I already had that mental preparation that maybe this wouldn't be my lucky round. And you know, there are other people that have applied many times, and it's their turn um, in a sense. But yeah, I guess I was quite lucky, and maybe the preparation I did was quite effective. So I'm just in a very good position now. No, yeah, I guess that's that, that's an amazing way to look at it. Is even though it's more like your turn to get in. Obviously, if you, you're not only applying against the people, say, say like if you were in your A-levels, you, you're only applying within that year group of across the country people who have also done A-levels with universities. It's much different in that you have got people that have been applying for two, three years, and fortunately, they do have two, three years worth of more experience than you, so I totally agree with that. I guess, so you've been at med school for, well, six months now, uh, half a year. Yeah. How, how do you feel that your particular course is adapted to, like, COVID and teaching online? Has it been, like, difficult or how do you feel like they've adapted to the changes? Um, so I think every uni has done good things and maybe not so great things. Um majority of our lectures are pre-recorded um but we have been going 
into university for things like dissection, um, anatomy teaching, quite a bit of physiology, um, and also clinical skills because obviously that's something you just you just can't learn via Microsoft Teams. Um, but things like GP placement are still not happening and we're doing them virtually, which is, it makes do for the time being. It's not excellent, but, you know, it's a good meet in the middle. Yeah, and I guess it's a university's job to get this balance, obviously. MMU is, they, they've tried their best to obviously balance the academic side. It's been a lot of pre-recorded lectures, but as you probably well know, with a biomed degree you need to do a lot of practicals and not being able to go into uni with that has I guess seriously affected the course quality and the content being offered obviously we're still being asked to do the same amount of work submit the same um, assessments but we're not getting that face-to-face -face time anymore I think some students have found that particularly difficult so Again, I don't know how that's going to affect us going into third year, but mm. I guess we'll wait and see. <laughs> it feels like such a shame because obviously I did exactly the same course as you and I sort of understand how much that lab time makes a difference. So it, fe it feels like it's a shame that you're not really getting the same quality of teaching. Yeah, and I, I guess it's even more, more damaging to the people that, have the hat set on going into say a laboratory role obviously most students studying biomed statistically don't go on to be a biomedical scientist but for those students that want to go on to it it's critical to get their IBMS accredited course which is hopefully still going to happen but <laughs> um, so <laughs> yeah so um, I guess talking about MMU how how do you feel like how do you feel the course from MMU, obviously you understand the competitiveness and it's dependent on obviously year to year. How do you feel that's translated to obviously the course that you run now? Do you feel like it's still, I guess if it was very competitive, or do you feel like it's more of you guys have made it now, you guys are all on graduate entry. It's more like calm down and you're more supportive of each other. Um, let me have a think. I would say... My time at MMU was probably a little bit different to other people's um, in the sense that I don't feel I had a, an incredible university experience. You know, when people say to you, university is going to be the best time of your life, I think it gets your hearts and your hopes so, so, and sort of like, okay, this, this isn't all that. Um, but actually coming here has been a completely different university experience and you do have a really really strong sense of community um so there's only 44 people on my course um despite having met many of them face to face i feel like i know most of them and if something um that i felt i needed to say to somebody or i needed to ask for help i feel like i could message any of them and be like hey do you mind helping me on this but i think doing biomed I had no idea about what anybody was doing <laughs> yeah and I can totally relate to that obviously being I guess it's halfway through my degree now they're done it's it's getting to the point where I'm halfway through my degree and I know these this little subject this little subsection of people well and I can go to them and ask for help but the other probably 240 students in my cohort I couldn't put a name to the face. It's, it's, it's one of them, and obviously you can relate, and I can relate to what you said. And the universe is supposed to be a magical experience, and I'm halfway through it. I'm like, it's, it's okay. It, it's okay. I'm, I'm getting the grades. I'm doing well. It's not. I'm getting the grades. I'm doing well. It's nothing, nothing that special, <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully covid does change things and to to be on a serious note it has become even difficult to especially with the first years as well who will probably uh, be watching this from the site even them meeting new people from their course has probably been 10 times to 100 times harder than it was for myself a year before so yeah it's 
just hopefully it gets uh, it gets better soon. I, I guess talking about your well, your limited time at med school, has there been any like particular myths or like misconceptions that you thought was stigmatized uh, within med school before you got there? Ooh, I don't know. I know. <laughs> what sort of myths are you talking about? <laughs> so some previous ones have been like you have to be like super smart or super intelligent or I I guess like medical schools like super hierarchical you, you need to be like the top students to get the top places for example okay I feel like this is quite interesting and I think I come from a different um perspective to everybody um I didn't have great A levels coming in here and I felt that would almost be detrimental to my application most people even going into grad med are still people with three a's or you know a star and two a's and they just didn't know it's what they wanted to do i had two c's and a d (laughs) so things are not looking bright um i think i recall being told many times that i was going into the wrong field and it'd be too much be too much for me but um it's not it really is about work ethic. I wouldn't say I'm the brightest pupil. I wouldn't say I'm the most intelligent. But if you put the time into it and you chip away at it, it really is manageable. You know, it's not rocket science. Um, yeah. You just have to keep going. And it's and it's having the perseverance. And I think it's more of a test of character than a test of your intelligence. <laughs> yeah, and I think from where you've come from to where you're at now, a lot of students can can apply themselves to uh, your footsteps obviously not every student's going to get three A stars because then med schools would be full of people with three A stars but like t- taking from personal experience with myself like my first my first A levels uh, from my first year was just just a write-off so then I went to study uh, BTEC applied sciences and at that point I knew I had to put my foot down and step on the pedal to get like the, the highest grades but obviously no universities except BTEX on undergraduate hence me applying for biomed and then having to obviously apply for grad med so I guess for, from your experience and people being able to relate to you I think it's really valuable that you almost show people that you, you can make it if you it, not if you mess up but if you don't get the best grades or if you if you don't succeed, say in A levels, you can always pull it back and still get there eventually. So it's really commendable that you, you you've actually made it, and there'll be sure there'll be quite a lot of people looking at this video and say, "Well, if she's made it, then why can't I?" Yeah, I think I think that's definitely something I would want to tell people because I think there's so there's so much out there now that it's like people saying, you know, this is what I did and this is where I am now. But when I look at those people, I'm, I always think, yeah, but your grades still aren't quite as bad as mine. So is it really possible? And before I actually did it, I didn't know anybody that was in the same position as me. I'd never spoken to somebody that just basically flopped their A-levels. I could probably have done better, but I really didn't. Um, I'd never spoken to anybody that was in the same position. So I think there are people out there that are in a similar position to me and yeah, maybe this this will be what tells them, you know, you still got a chance, you know, your A levels don't define who you are, you know, it, your education doesn't end after your A levels. So just keep at it. For sure. And I guess you you've been at med school for quite a few months now. What have you found keeps you motivated through such an intense course like medicine? Obviously, you said it was really, really content heavy. So what keeps you motivated during that? Um, <laughs> the idea that for me, it's only going to last a year. So at Barts, we only do two clinical studies for a year. So we do year and year two in our first year at university. And I just remind myself, I've been months of this left. <laughs> perfect and I guess I guess the other side is talking like MMU specific MMU has quite a lot of extracurriculars if that be you're into some societies or sports groups for etc have you found that that translates to obviously your degree now obviously you're probably not doing as much 
is it still manageable to say manage like a part time job, for example, or say societies or sports? Um, I have to be honest. I think maybe it's partly due to how content heavy the degree is, and also COVID. I haven't joined a single society, <laughs> so I, I I can only be honest about that. In terms of job wise, I think universities say that we can't really have a proper job. We can maybe spare six to eight hours a week. Okay. Um. Other than that, I do a little bit of tutoring. Um, you know, I help guide some people through their UCAS applications. Um, I like to go running. That's pretty much it. I have a very study heavy schedule. <laughs> okay. And I guess I didn't ask you with your with your actual uh, admissions. Did you did you get one offer just for Queens, or did you get multiple offers? So I received offers for Casey Allen Queens. Okay, so I guess what made you what made you choose Queens over Kings? Um, <laughs> I don't want to out any of the unions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't want them to hate me, but um, I found that my experience with Kings was lovely. I loved the place, you know. I love London. Um. I don't know whether it, maybe it was because COVID hit and it delayed things, but their response time was so painfully slow. <laughs> when you're literally sat on the edge of your chair and you're refreshing student room every single hour and checking your emails, it just gets a bit too much. So I got my box offer first and I just thought to myself, hey, I may as well take it. I was really happy with the interview. It was that one interview that I thought to myself, wow, this really stands in line with my personal ethos I loved how holistic the approach was you know we weren't we weren't sort of pushed along a conveyor belt through MMIs um, they really got to know us as people we got an opportunity to um, show our personal strengths and characteristics which they were really interested in so yeah and I'm, I'm happy with my choice obviously that's what everybody's going to say about <laughs> this, but I'm happy no yeah I can totally relate that Queens is very, very unique in their way of obviously interviewing people, and I guess it's the right way to say that you're not pushed through each each room every ten minutes, and you're not ten minutes cut off. You're on to the next one. Yeah. So I do totally agree with that. Uh, they're actually spending time to get to know you, which is, is very useful for other people to know that it's not just another sit down. You do your teamwork and then you, you have your interview and then the next person comes in. So thank you for that. So I, I guess moving on though, what does what does a week in the life look at Queen's? Obviously, you probably know only during COVID, but what does a week in the life of obviously a graduate entry medicine course at Queen's look like now? Um, do you mean in terms of like... Oh, like during, during time... Yeah, so just like, say, what lectures do you have on a weekly basis? With like, how many placements do you have for etc.? Okay, so in general, in a week, I can have a look for you. Um, we do about twelve pre-recorded lectures. Okay. Um, and then we do probably one or two anatomy live sessions so that's you know on teams um we also do micro anatomy and um we also have like question and answer sessions and then on top of that we also do pbl which is twice a week um and that's two hours each time and then one day a week is usually spent either on a gp placement or um doing clinical skills and that's on sort of a growing basis. Um, and then recently they've introduced us going in for dissections and physiology, which has been really nice. Wow. It's been nice to see people. <laughs> wow. So, it, again, it does sound like a very intense course, but <laughs> I, I guess it's all about time management and keeping up on top of your pre-recorded lectures. Again, almost every student 
will be able to relate with that this year because <laughs> that's all it's been. <laughs> Definitely. So I, I guess what's your what's your vision going into the future then? Obviously, you've made it. You're at graduate entry. Where do you see yourself going into the future? Um, I hope to. Actually... I know it's a. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, graduate and then foundation training. And then I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I want to be a GP or if I want to do a hospital specialty. I've not really thought that far ahead. I just want to get through my degree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And I guess, I guess, for future medical students, obviously watching this video, the only like golden piece of advice you give them going through the application process. Um, stick at it. Keep going and reach out for help when you think you need it don't feel like you're walking alone because that was probably the worst experience for me because nobody in my class that I knew at MMU was doing the same thing as me the people around me didn't really have a good grasp of what grad entry was um I couldn't really ask anybody for help so it did feel a little bit lonely at times because it felt like I went into third year and I almost did double the workload of everybody else which felt awful and um, I just had to keep telling myself well if I get in I'll never have to do this again. No and this was this was the whole idea of obviously me setting up this society when when I first had the thought of setting it up I didn't know anybody that wanted to study graduate entry. It was just, oh yeah, th see these people on YouTube doing these graduate entry courses and have a look into it. And I, oh, this is actually, do you know, a feasible option for me. And tried to actually contact the uni and find what resources were available. And MMU doesn't really have anything <laughs> on a graduate entry. So I guess the question would be, what what, what resources did you find, like, particularly useful through like your time at MMU did you have is there any particular resources that MMU provide that you found particularly useful or was it just everything off your own back that you found um I actually don't think I found anything at uni very helpful <laughs> <laughs> they're going to come after me for saying that um I don't know it is it's lots of little bits and pieces that you pick up along the way you know a couple of YouTube videos you know um, you speak to a couple of people you know you try to arrange conversations like this I was very very lucky and I got in touch with somebody that I knew that was able to sort of tutor me through the whole experience um, obviously not specific to grad entry but just in terms of doing medicine and I would highly recommend that if you have the finances available and you have the time to spare why not put your everything into it if it's what you want to do. Yeah and going back to obviously this society having yes you, you can speak to these uh, doctors that have went through the application 20-30 years ago but I guess it's speaking to the people that have gone through it recently who have the best idea and the most up-to-date knowledge on the actual system and the actual admissions process and I guess that's why your your experience is so much more valuable than somebody that's had 20 years worth of experience in the NHS. Yeah, I hope so. I hope this is helpful. <laughs> if it helps no. one, that would make me happy. <laughs> Perfect. And... I guess finally for somebody starting their first day at Queen's, what what would be your take on tips for that student? Um get organized. <laughs> um get organized and don't feel that you have to study the same way that you did in your undergrad. So be flexible. That, that's that's a good point to touch on how I guess how did you find the the transfer from obviously studying at MMU is very content heavy you need to know these facts but luckily well even luckier this year you need to know it for six weeks and then it's gone forever you don't need to know it anymore so yeah so MMU's so the traditional way of them doing it was like 
two units and then the exam at like Christmas and then another two units and then the exam at like April we had. Um, this year they've completely changed it. They've done it. So say our first unit was blood science and then we had that for six weeks and then we had some MCQs during uh, during like the middle of the uh, unit and then like an exam at the end. And mm. then we started like infection science around about November and then we just had our exams uh, in January, right after Christmas. But <laughs> it's different to how I did it. So, did you not have like the two units and then the exams and then the other two units? No. No. Um, I did all the exams in the summer. I don't know. I just oh, wow. and maybe some people that were in my class will correct me, but. From my memory, I remember doing all the exams at the end of the year. We had coursework for each module, and then the exam was at the end. I want to so, say. I don't, if I remember correct, I think they changed that the first year I started. So maybe... Quite possible. Because <laughs> it's always been like two units and then the exam and then another two units. But I, I guess it's worked out for some students because... Once, once you know your content, like I completely forgot blood science, I completely forgot infection science. So you just focus on that that six weeks. Yes, it's very intense. You need to get this piece of coursework, these MCQ questions, and this exam done all in this time. But it's, I guess, I guess it's easier for them to manage, and it's really benefited the students as well because yours get to know how much how how close you are to Joe hitting well your degree at the end of the day obviously you can just add up the percentages as you go so it's more of you're tracking you're tracking the status of how much you've got on each unit so I guess that's one commendable thing I can say about MMU this year I'm not going to talk about anything else but and <laughs> um, yeah I, I guess again thank you for taking the time out of your evening to come speak to me it's been it's been a real privilege and it's even this connections like a year ago i couldn't have i couldn't have spoke to anybody but now linkedin i can just message you and a few days later i found out all of these facts and all of these tips that'll help well hopefully future MMU grad entry meds <laughs> but no, I really hope so and um if anybody has any more questions I would I would be more than happy to answer them or if somebody just wants to reach out and have a chat ask me more questions yeah feel free perfect thank you so I guess finally is there anywhere our viewers can find you online or get in contact with you if they have any questions um Add me on LinkedIn. I'll happily send you my email over. Um, email me. Add me on Facebook. Whatever, really. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Again, thank you for uh, taking time to read in, and uh, I wish you the best of luck. Thank um, you. Wish you the best of luck too. Thank you. All right, take care, Olivia. You too. All right. Bye.